Welcome to the Michael Harding Podcast. It's Bloomsday, the 16th of June, 2023. For the summer, I'm going to share with you a little bit from all the different memoirs I've been writing over a decade. And I'm beginning with the most recent one, All the Things Left Unsaid. Alice was an elderly lady I knew in Glengevlin in the 1970s. The parish priest at the time, Eamon Lynch, showed her great kindness and wanted to accommodate her in the parish house. But she refused. He offered her various options, but she refused to be separated from her cow so that she was sometimes lodged in an outhouse in the backyard and spent her days in the kitchen until a prefab, a one-room space, was built for her. And because I sometimes enjoyed Eamon's company, I too was blessed with her friendship. She had a deep and extraordinary connection with nature and animals, with the rain and sun, with the dawn and the moonlit nights. Her sense of belonging in the wild world with bees and birds and farming animals embodied a joy that there is no word to describe. How could I forget you? You were the only one who saw me as a rogue, with one fogged up eye and one clear eye. You would look at me warily as you sat in the ditch, hairy harding, you'd say, because my beard was long. Here comes hairy harding. Other days, you wouldn't recognise me even when I sat down beside you. Who's there? you would say. And when I spoke, you'd confess. I can't see today. And I'd say you can see well enough, Alice, because the only blindness is in the heart. Sitting on the ditch all day with your cow on a rope as she ate from the long grass. And then one day recently, who comes to call on me in Leitrim when I'm not at home but Vincent McGovern, who works in London now and has written a book and wanted to leave it with me. He didn't know I had fled to the sea, to Donegal. He came all the way from London on a big motorcycle and I wasn't at home because I'm here in Donegal, but he left the book anyway and he signed it from Vincent to Harry Harding. And the phrase took me back to Glengevlin, that beautiful valley in the Kilka Mountains, where you and I first met, and where you first put that tag on me. The fair valley that gathered in its soul a mythic tale of origins, and a tribe of McGovern people, and spoke in Gaelic up to the time that you were born. Harry Harding was a tag that Vincent and other school children picked up, and it travelled as a nickname to the adults and all around the valley. I became almost as renowned as yourself. People would say, I seen Harry Harding and Alice de Goat sitting on the ditch at the church today. What would them two be talking about? Indeed, what would you and me be talking about? But you and I know that we had lots to talk about. The priest, that kind man, Eamon, who gave both of us lodgings back then, said it first. I remember you sitting in his kitchen one day, that enormous old kitchen in the priest's house, and he was beside you on this old sofa, and you were crying, 
as you often did, about Rabbit, your name for the cow, because you were always troubled if Rabbit the cow was coughing too much and maybe would die. Rabbit was like a child to you. She was more than a child. She was husband and wife, mother and father, land and identity. You carried your nation in that cow. You retained your dignity on the roads with that cow. You had a cow. But Alice, Eamon said, Rabbit is as healthy as a trout. I looked at him, wanting to say, Eamon, that's too many animals. The cow called Rabbit being as healthy as a trout. But I said nothing because you were weeping. You were tiny. You were no more than the height of my waist. And you had long white hair and the old coat tied with rope around you. And you could hardly see because of that foggy eye. I know what it was now. It was cataracts, because I had four months of them myself after my retina detached. But there were no skilled surgeons in those days to fix the eye of a poor woman. There were no doctors to examine you, except for old Dr. Mohan in Black Lion, with his leather bag and his white hair, and of whom you said, He's as old as myself, when you were dismissing the idea of Father Eamon bringing you down to him for an examination, as if being old implied that he might not have had any schooling. But Eamon was kind, and he looked at you weeping over the cow that evening, and he said, Alice, Rabbit will be well. She can't be sick. Why not? you wondered. Because she has an angel to watch over her, he said. And you cried. That's when you cried. Because it was a soft thing to say. A kind thing to say. Alice, Eamon said, you are the angel. And later, when you were gone out to sleep in the shed, myself and Eamon reflected on your angelic route as we sipped mugs of tea. Truly, there was something about you that he had named. There was something off the face of God that he saw. In Islam, they say, I look everywhere and see the face of God. And we looked at you, Alice, and saw the light under the skin, a glow of something beautiful, a trace of divine grace. There was something of the angel's voice that I always heard whenever you spoke in that soft, dour accent. Eamon would certainly have given you the softest of blankets if you had agreed to take up residence in that cosy room just off the kitchen, and you would have been the queen of the house a house built by Senator McGovern from Massachusetts in 1927 as a gift to the little mountain parish in Ireland where his people came from. And Eamon would have been delighted with you there, instead of out in the shed, with a brown cow in one corner and you lying on bales of straw in the other. At night, when I would be coming home from the pub, I'd often hear you talking away to your pet, laughing and sharing jokes. And what I thought strange was the fact that you were never lonely. She's an angel, Eamon said, in all sincerity. Because you were giving us so much, your gentle manners your alert presence in the room, your quiet spoken wisdom came to us like revelations of how to behave in the world. 
and you had been through hardship that we could only read about in books. You were born in a world where your parents were still paying rent in Cavan to Trinity College for the meagre few acres of stone and rushes and for the thatched damp cottage with flagstone floors in a central room of mud floors in a single bedroom. You were walking to Cavan the journey of a full day to pay rent in cash when you were a young girl and your father was ill and your mother unable to walk. And what happened to you between then and the time I met you, I don't know. But life had not hardened you. That's the point, Alice. Not even when you ended up in a damp, abandoned cottage on the mountain, with a thatched roof that fell in on one side, devastating the old kitchen, and leaving you with just a single room and a few sheets of tarpaulin to endure the winter. That's when Eamon heard of you and brought you to the parish house. I've been through a few difficulties in the past year. I've had a few operations, and I came here to the wild Atlantic coast to recuperate. And I have had that fog in the eye that closes you in, so I know a little about what I'm saying. But I've never spent nights never mind years, lying in a shed on straw, or lying under a fallen thatch, or sitting alone on a ditch with a cow. I've never known what it is to cling to a relationship with a cow as if she were mother and father, brother and sister. I used to ask you about your brother, and you just say, he's gone a long time with such sorrow that I couldn't bear to be further curious. And have you no one else? I'd ask, and you'd leave a silence, and then you'd whisper, no one. That could have left you bitter, or angry, or coarse, or brutalised, or so I thought, but it didn't, because I never met as gentle a woman, as soft and kind a hand on my head, when you would reach out and caress it, and then laugh, fingering my beard, muttering the words, Harry Harding. So when Vincent arrived to the house in Leitrim with the book he had published, and which the Guardian newspaper in Britain hailed as an important book, about family law, my beloved phoned me and said, there's someone here for you, and she put Vincent on the phone, and there I was all of a sudden talking again to Vincent, the same Vincent who was only about twelve years old when I was in Glengevlin, and must be in his sixties now, and I hadn't seen him since. For a while I felt guilty, I'm only twenty minutes away from Glangevlin, and yet that drive up along the shores of the lake and through the little village of Dowra always seemed too long. It was like driving into the past, driving back decades to where I once was. In the mid-seventies, it was in the hot summers that you loved because you could take off your winter coat and sit on the same ditch in a coloured cardigan that Eamon gave you as a gift from his sister and because there were more people on the roads than in the bleak, windy days of winter. Tractors taking water up the hills to farmhouses in the drought and Joe McGovern fixing broken rakes and link boxes, and queues of young lads in Wellingtons smoking cigarettes outside the garage, and me on the ditch with you, on my way home to the same august parish house we shared. We talked about dancing and music and 
what tunes people played in the old days as you remembered them. Because back then we danced and sang and there was nothing else in our world. We didn't have instruments and we weren't among the important people of the world but we sang and we sang without end. We danced half sets in the kitchens of the public houses and the mechanic's garage and in Glengevlin Hall and in every pub from Black Lion to Dowra. We joked with guards on the way home when we saw their torches in the distance flagging us down with the shadow of soldiers in the ditches around them. Just imagine, we were drunk and smart alecky with the police and yet they let us go. Back then drink didn't bother anyone as much. The police were looking for terrorists, for gunmen on the run. Although if we had known where they were hiding, we would have said even less than nothing. Because the guards were not considered to be on our side. They were on the side of the state, the forces of law and order, and we inhabited a different space where fun and love were the be-all and end-all of life. Our world was a bubble of music that lasted till morning. It lasted until the fiddle player stopped. It lasted until we had gone through every Hank Williams record in the drawer to keep the kitchen dancing. And I remember going back to the fiddle player's lovely house years later and finding that it was derelict. And so I went to his son's house, but he too had died, and I asked a neighbour woman where his wife had gone, and she said that his wife too had gone to the grave. In another house I saw a picture of the four of us, the son and his wife, me and Annie Jo, doing a half-set, and you sitting on the wall with your stick and white hair, laughing at the laughter. The photograph was laminated and framed and hung so proudly on the wall, and even the man who took the photograph was in another grave somewhere else. The light of heaven to them all, as you used to say, and what is not in the photograph is the following day and the day after. The endless days, when I would meet you as I drove home from my teaching job in Lawn House, and I'd get out of the car and sit on the ditch and smoke a cigarette as we conversed about the ancestry of humans and the cures on the skin of animals and the boys that used to throw water on the adults in the old sweat houses to cool them down. I had nowhere to go and I had all the time in the world, as they say, to idle the day. Well, master, you would begin, just like Mickey Dominic, who always asked the same question at night in the pub to open up conversation. Well, master, what did you teach the young scholars today? You and Mickey Dominic came from the same cloth and time. When the poor went barefoot and envied the scholars and tried to gather a little learning on the ditches or at night in the rambling houses, tried to gather a meaning for life from the scraps that fell from the mouths of the rich. And that's where it always began with us. You would ask a question. You... You would set the agenda for our lovely conversation and we'd talk for an hour about dandelions or ragworth or the power of healing in holy medals. I felt we were like druids at the gates of the Christian monastery because it was usually just outside the priest's gates that we met, beside the pillar on the right-hand side. I passed it recently and felt sad to see how it has deteriorated. I felt sad, too, to see that the fiddler's house is choked with ivy, 
and the schoolyard is empty, and the roof fallen in, and there are townlands you and me trying to figure out that are forgotten among the Sitka forests. Townlands we chewed on, their names being embodied souls, their people being saints, in a litany we recited. By naming things we called them into mind, the forgotten townlands, the lost people, the abandoned cottages, the ones in England and America. It was our ancient druidic ritual on the ditch, with my shining black and orange Ford Escort sitting idle at the turn. But the thing is that when Vincent arrived on the bike from London, he didn't know he was conjuring up again all your wonderful light. I wasn't even looking at him. He was just on the phone, and he spoke fast, and he was hard to follow, and the book, I said, the book, yes, I must read it. But when I put down the phone, it was you that came to mind, your angelic light brightening up the little house by the ocean. And when I opened the parcel that my beloved sent the following day, and saw the inscription on it, it was you clearly that had come into the house. To Harry Harding. I belonged in those mountains. I belonged on that ditch. I belonged with you at my side, and the dandelions growing wild round us. It wasn't just the nights of eternal joy that I found in the kitchens and the pubs and the dancing half-sets, but it was there with you, on the ditch, or on the sofa of the big kitchen, when you always asked me to tell you everything about last night's fun. I think you relished the stories as if you had been there. I fancied they reminded you of some long-ago times, when you were young and loved, and were full of fun. But if that's the case, you certainly kept it all to yourself. You were a great woman for the long silence. You never spoke ill of anyone, but you could, ho you could hold long silences that were devastating. And when you didn't want to answer a question, you were implacable. I would walk from one house to another on those evenings after parking my car at the priest's house. I would drop in to Phelim and watch the child on Kitty's knee. The child I spilled a cup of tea over when he was about three months old and caused such an almighty stir. Fortunately, and thank God for me, that the scalding tea left no scar a fact the child assured me of when I met him in Drumshambo forty years later. And then I'd pop into Lizzie James Huey from Armagh, who was married to Oni, and had a beautiful child at the kitchen table doing her homework. And finally, on my route around the loop of Monian Sauron, the little bogs of the McGovern, I'd call in on Fairley a man who minded sheep on the mountains and read his way through philosophy books in winter. And I'd end up in a kitchen of a great musician who kept his ancestor's sword hanging on the wall. A weapon that belonged to a bishop who went over and back to Spain on trading ships in the 18th century studying theology, a time when a weapon was a necessary passport on the high seas. And those rambling afternoons full of music and history always ended in desire when I was driving the young women to faraway dance halls in Swanlam Bar or Ballinamore or Drumshambo. The happiest years of your life, you used to say to me, these are the happiest years of your life. And you were right. I would never have known the ordinariness of compassion 
or the casual ground of intimacy that is as natural to rural living as the soft rain and drizzle is to the hills above Black Lion. But it's your face, Alice, that remains, your fogged eye and your clear blue and kindly eye, your listening smile, your soft wild white hair, and the way you'd keep brushing it back from your face, your sensual wide lips and the purple blotch just below your mouth. I remember it all as I remember the silence, as I remember lying awake sometimes pondering Eamon's observation. She's an angel, he would say. And I know now that there are no accidents, Alice. Not a leaf falls without it being willed by God. He did everything he could to improve your conditions. He was blue in the face talking to people in the county council and the health board to get you out of the shed with the cow. Eventually you agreed to a prefab and the council agreed to build it. You were slow to say yes, and difficult, even when you had agreed to it. Where will I put Rabbit? you wanted to know. Eamon said that Rabbit would still be in the shed, and well fed and well sheltered, and that the council could put the prefab up on the land just above the outhouses, so that even if Rabbit did call for you in the night, you'd hear him. It was the way we lived in those days. And so the prefab was erected and you were installed and the parish came to know it as Alice's prefab. It became the signpost on the road. If you were giving directions, you might tell someone to turn left at Alice's prefab. And you stood in the door, rotund, a blue cardigan draped on your stout shoulders, the stick in your hand, the white hair tidied up like a girl in Daura who did all the women's hair. But you wouldn't let me in. I could see from the door that the space within had been transformed into the chaos of the shed. The bed was hardly used, and the box stove was not lit, you were uneasy about lighting it. My mother often said those things are not healthy, you claimed. I think about Glangevlin a lot, and still marvel at the open-hearted way that people embraced me. But if there was a person then who remained in my memory as a single icon of that world, it was you, because your life was the most rugged and brutal and impoverished, and yet your laughter was the most gentle, your smile was the clearest and brightest, your silence was the most inviting. You went down to the pub for food very often, and Mary, or indeed anyone who was there, would gladly offer you a dinner. You belonged in the community, and showed us part of our invisible self, how could that not be an accurate description of an angel? I remember the day the prefab was dismantled. The council had it knocked, folded and up on the back of the lorry in less than an hour. All that remained was a cube of blackened earth within a patch of yellowed grass and an empty gas cylinder. I stood on the black soil where no grass had grown and looked at the square of earth you had called home. There was something beautiful about the land all around, the rushes and the sally and ash trees, the roofs of the outhouses and the bottom of the hill, the crows that always congressed in the trees around that priest's house. I remember it vividly, as a sense of 
how little trace we leave on earth. And while I remember that moment clearly, I have no recollection of your funeral, or the passing of Rabbit the Cow, who, as far as I remember from the folklore of the time, actually survived you and was cared for by the priest, fondly, until her time on earth was over. And I've said over and over again that the women in Glengavlin were a kind of collective mother to me. They minded me and taught me the importance of laughter, joy, intimacy and love. But you were different. You were like the face of something deeply sacred an enduring presence, a reassurance that, in someone who ought to have been brutalised by the hardships and injustices of life, you had retained a huge heart of kindness, gentleness and joy. Words are beautiful and only true as far as they go. They only encompass the reality they name. So their effervescence and fragility is astonishing. The poet's language flies like a bird, and the prose writer is surrounded by shot-down things that lie in sentences as flat as dead birds in a field. And with the fragility of words, there is a way that grasping them chokes everything on the page. Grasping a memory leads to acres of dead birds. Enveloping the past in crimes that have wounded me only hardens my heart to stone. But Alice was like a word. She was the embodiment of a sensibility that there was no name for. Her little stub nose and thick-set lips and foggy eye gave her the aspect of a Buddha. And when she laughed, her face broke open with joy. And when her hands moved from the stick to the air, flapping like a bird as she described the colour of the night, it was like watching language take flesh. Each movement conveyed the steady intimacy of her presence. She was there with me then. And when I asked about Rabbit the cow, she would bow her head as if like a clown. She was mimicking sleep. A rabbit is sleeping, I would conjecture, and her head would nod. Rabbit was sleeping. And even now, when the stone comes into my mouth, she takes it out, and when my tongue cannot form the word, I hear her speak. You can see that I'm fond of Alice, and that's an excerpt. You know, the book All the Things Left Unsaid is a book of gratitude, I suppose, and shock. When I looked around at the amount of people who had passed away during COVID and during a time where I was myself in hospital a few times, and it was like the end of an era, it was like, you know, coming of age, I was coming towards 70 years of age, and the priest that married us at our wedding passed away, the best man passed away, the bridesmaid passed away. That was Tom Hickey, Mary McPartland. These were wonderful, gifted, one an actor, one a musician. And they were close friends. And, and when I looked back on their lives, I realised that they had done so much for me. And I'd never had an opportunity at the end of their life to to actually sit down and say that with them, to say, you, you know, how much you have done for me and how grateful I am for the good that you brought to me. Same with Bernard Lachlan was another, he was director in Anna McCarrick. These people, like, they were so good 
they gave me such goodness. They helped me along the path in life in such huge ways. I never really sat down and said that to them. And then when they died, it was always a surprise. I was taken aback when they passed away. And I thought, I was recovering from my own illness. I was walking up and down the beach in Donegal. I just thought about them and I thought, you know, I'll write them letters. And that's where I got the idea for all the things left unsaid. I finished a tour with the book. We were in 20 venues and there's a demand from about eight more venues. So I'll be back in the autumn on the road to Ballina and Virginia and Cavan and Cavan Town and Roscommon Town and a few other places. Um, I'm so happy with that book. I'll just finish by reading you another little excerpt. Because the, the, the letters in that book all have a different tone. And one of the ones that I'm, I'm most fond of is the one I've just read to Alice McHugh. But he, here's one of a sequence. So it's a little bit out of context. And uh, it's, it's to a friend. And I'll read you a little bit of it. Okay, it goes like this. Fuck it, what have I done? I feel I've wasted an entire year here at the ocean. Two months watching box sets, wearing pyjamas and listening to the wind howling. Now it's February and my tooth almost fell out today. At least an entire wall of it collapsed, but the filling, which was put in years ago, remained intact. I went to a dentist in Letterkenny who was kind enough to see me at short notice. She was a woman from Eastern Europe and said perhaps it would need to be taken out or at least the filling would come out and then she'd have to do root canal work. I just laid there on my back in her chair half terrified of the details and half happy that it was her because she seemed very competent and kind. So when do we begin, I wondered, expecting that she'd have me back the following day. Maybe we will just wait and see what happens, she said. There is a possibility that the filling will remain intact and even though you lost some tooth, we might not need to do anything. Well, after showing me all the dangers first, I found this conclusion delightful. I walked out of the clinic as if I was walking on air. Just call if it gets worse or if you feel pain, she said. And here, I'm feeling no pain, feeling joyful, just because I didn't have to get me tooth out, just because I avoided root canal treatment for the moment. And I'm amazed at how simple life can be sometimes. No, how simple we are. How quickly we fall into heaven. How open we are to the prospect of angels, redemption, freedom and second chances. So that's when something washed away in me. Some sorrow that had clung to me all winter began to dissolve. It's as if I was waiting to be healed of stuff and yet I was nursing the wounds. My operation last year has left me with an injured body. My bodily functions have been impaired. My retina has detached. And although fixed in January, the doctor says it will be another month before I recover the sight in my left eye. It will require another procedure, he says, to sort out a cataract that has developed. And I get weary thinking, wondering, will it end? And then thinking that maybe it won't end. It'll go on. If this doesn't get me, something else will, because I'm entering that time in life called old age. Don't let the old man in is superbly true, but don't fool yourself either. He's out in the garden, and some day he'll get you when you're not fucking looking. But sure, look, 
you have to remember, I did spend some time on the road as an actor. And you don't do that and survive unless you have a sense of humour. There's too much pain in the life of an actor between the failed attempts to embody a narrative that gets rejected publicly over and over again. And if that is a bit like doing therapy in public, then there is also the vexed question of getting an audience. How many are in tonight, every actor wants to know, in the waiting moments that she or he spends in the green room before the lights go up? I remember one of the most painful moments happened to me in Kilmallock. I arrived on a wet Saturday afternoon and presented myself to a member of the amateur drama company who was cleaning away the flats from the previous night's production of a play by John B. Keane. Oh, it went fantastically well, he said. They were hanging from the rafters and they nearly broke themselves with laughter. We'll have to bring it back again in a week or two. I was carrying my bench, the one I used in the production of Swallow. I carried it like the lid of a coffin and asked him if he or someone else was doing the lights for the show later that evening. I didn't know there was anything on tonight, he said, a bit confused, but I'll ring the director and she can sort you out. So he phoned the woman who ran the theatre and I sat in the back row of the hall waiting for her to ring me. Maybe they forgot I was coming. Or maybe a brief 25-minute show involving a man standing on a bench with a sad little poster proclaiming the show to have been a hit at the Dublin Theatre Festival wasn't a great enticement to the people of Kilmallock. Perhaps having seen a lively keen play on the Friday night, they weren't going to be enticed back on a wet Saturday in November. One way or another, it became clear when the lady who ran the theatre arrived that something was wrong. The chairman of her committee was with her and she confessed after a lot of whispering with him in her office that in fact they had no bookings. No bookings, like no bookings at all. We'd be better to shift the performance to the rehearsal room upstairs, she said. And I wondered, like, why, if there's no bookings? That's the bit I could never understand. I wanted to say it might be better not to put it on if there was no audience, but I was innocent and had no manager and feared my fee might dissolve into the same place the audience were hanging out. Nowhere. So I agreed to put the show on at the appointed hour in the rehearsal room upstairs. And I know I should have discussed the money. I should have known that I could have called on a guarantee. But back then it wasn't like that. I was innocent and so were they. We were all amateurs to an extent. And like the naive presumption that there is a God... We both presumed that since I was there, the show must go on. The only problem was how to create an audience. The chairman of the committee mustered ten chairs, and five of them were taken as the play began. One of them was the lighting man from the Amateur Drama Society, whom I had met earlier. One was the woman who ran the venue, and one was the chairman, who fell asleep even in the brief time that I was on the bench confessing the private grief of a Monaghan farmer as if it were my own. And even the script didn't shelter me from the shame and humiliation I was feeling as I stood on the bench playing my part. I was like a child in a classroom being tortured by the world. Maybe it wasn't even the drama on stage that I relished when I was touring. Maybe it was the other dramas, the ones off stage, that I loved. My grandfather was a pig dealer. He walked the streets of every Ulster town from Cavan to Belfast and visited every fair from Coleraine to Armagh in search of animals he would purchase and put on trains to Cavan. And he would come home triumphant on the last train after, weeks on the road, with the money in his boot. 
I felt him sitting in the back seat of the car when I was on the road because I too loved the road. The flavours of different towns, the ease of always being a stranger just arrived. I remember once on the street in Tralee looking into a shop window full of Halloween ghouls in black and orange when a man stood behind me and commented on the play I had performed the night before in Shim Sachira. It was a great performance last night, the man said, and I enjoyed it. I said, thank you. What's your name? Sullivan, he said. Sullivan from Cherney. He gave no Christian name, just his family handle and the place he came from. I hadn't a clue where Cherney was, but I understood the connection between identity and location in rural Ireland. And what about the time I was in the bath in the Clarion Hotel in Limerick, just hours before the opening, playing with bath gels and sachets of expensive shampoo when the phone rang? It was a teacher at the prison with a request. Would I meet the prisoners? I agreed to go to the prison because that was the best thing about being on the road as an actor. It wasn't the acting or the play or the performance that excited me. It was simply being on the road and hearing more stories. So I said yes to the prison, perhaps because I was in a good mood on the first day of the tour and the hotel, to me, a struggling actor, appeared luxurious and I wasn't thinking of the reality that I myself would be paying for it and perhaps too because the teacher on the phone from the prison was so complimentary about my acting and said she often saw me in plays in Dublin, and would it be awful for her to ask me to come and talk to the prisoners? Not at all, I declared majestically from my little world of bubbles, glad to oblige. I was expansive and exuberant and naked, and for some reason felt like James Bond or Pierce Brosnan or both, and perhaps she will bring other teachers and prison staff to the play, I thought, if I visit the prison. You're someone different, she said. It's important for them sometimes to meet someone different, to be able to talk to someone different. We can pay you, she said. How much? Two hundred euro. I almost dropped the phone into the ocean of bubble bath, but the deal was done. The following morning I was at the prison gates, at nine o'clock, standing in the rain, waiting for her to arrive and lead me through the various doors and security checks. By ten o'clock I'm inside, listening to prisoners and hoping to find a connection between their stories and whatever it is I do every night on the stages of the nation. I was staring at this woman who reminded me of a nun, in her grey cardigan and her eyes like pinpoints behind steel-rimmed glasses. We were in the small, fully fitted kitchen of the women's unit of the prison. It could have been her home, were it not for the double-plated glass wall through which I could see other women playing pool, and a fat prison officer with a beer belly and his cap pushed back on his head sitting in the corner reading yesterday's Evening Herald. For years before she was convicted of dealing in serious drugs, this woman kept dwarf hens and guinea pigs and rabbits in her back garden in the working-class estate where she lived so that the children of the street could come and enjoy them like rich children did when they went to the zoo in Dublin. She told me about all the pets she ever had and how she loved them and how the house would be full of children, always coming to see her crazy zoo. She had an owl that ate live mice, and a jackdaw that went to school with her daughter. She told me that she loved animals as a child, and that she could remember the day her father abandoned her. He left from the station. She went with him hand in hand, and he lifted her up, in the sky, and his arms were big like lumps of trees, and the plume of white steam from the train enveloped them on the platform, so she thought she was in the clouds going to heaven. 
but only her father went, and she suspected not to have him, and after some years his place was taken by her mother's new lover, whom she never liked. So she spent her youth in the fields talking to the donkey, until one day she went out and the donkey was dead. Its throat had been cut in the night. She looked out at me from behind the glasses, as if she were a mouse looking out from the safety of a dark cavern. She wore her story like a shell. She was safe so long as she stayed inside it. Her bony face never flinched. Her fist was always clenched on the table. She had no intention of telling me how she felt. I think of that woman too. The extraordinary suffering that she endured. And yet how beautiful she was. I mean, she was in prison. She did something wrong. But the stories she told about having a little zoo in her backyard to delight the children of the area she lived in. That's a story of an angel. And what I get absorbed in sometimes is, you know, what am I as the storyteller? I don't know the answer to it, but, but it just absorbs me as a question. So like, I pass through the world and I hear stories, like, like the story of Alice is one that I was intimately engaged with this woman, this old wise woman. But she's gone. It's over. Was her life meaningless? Was it like, is it nothing but a memory? And, and apart from me, would anybody me remember it? And the same could be said of the woman in prison. Who is to tell her story? Who is to you know, vindicate her before God. When I think of those people, when I think of everybody that has a story, I met a man today, and I won't tell you the story, but I got so excited. I met a man on the side of the street, on the side of the road. I was walking, having a long walk in the summer sun, and this fella stopped his car, and he talked out the window to me, and and he started telling me his life story. It does happen so easily that we kind of exchange stories. and It's like you're, you're feeling a, another person's life is opening up to you. And I tremble when I cross that threshold with somebody. When I begin to listen to their story. And even as I'm listening to somebody's story, I know that I'll be telling it to somebody else, somewhere else. I'll be on stage, I'll maybe a little audience like Kilmallock or thanks be to God, you know, this year doing 20 gigs, every one of them booked out. Full houses in the Everyman, in Cork and the Lime Tree in Limerick and Dublin, the Pavilion, all sorts of places, up and down the country, booked out. And I'm just there on the stage telling stories. And yes, part of it is professional, part of it is me performing, part of it is me an actor, but another part of it is me at prayer. Another part of it is me just calling to mind in remembrance the mystery of other people that I have shared their presence. I have been in their presence. And to be in their presence is to be in God's presence. I, I can't get my head around not believing in God if you listen to other humans. I, I mean, if you listen to the birds at dawn, you cannot believe in God. You cannot not believe in God. If you really listen, and especially if you listen to the silence in yourself. But other people's stories... I suppose that's my trade, other people's stories, and it's a privilege. 
a privilege to share it in this podcast. A privilege to share it with you. And I thank you for being here. And I'm going to be back, I hope, next week and through the summer with a sequence of these stories from all the memoirs. That was the most recent one, all the things left unsaid. And I go through the whole, there's about seven of them, it'll cover us for seven weeks. So rather than be too heavy and meditational during the summer months, I thought it might be nice to to be celebratory and to share some of the memoirs. And that's what I'll be doing, and I hope that you join me for some of them. Thanks again for being here. Bye-bye.